Well, good morning. Welcome to worship. If you happen to be watching online, welcome. We realize that many of you will watch first before you visit in person. Um, so we hope to meet you one day soon. There are a couple of announcements in the bulletin. As always, if you didn't get a bulletin, it's a good idea to have one. We believe in participation in worship. We want you active. It's not a performance, but this is something we offer to God together. You can get a bulletin at any entrance this morning. Also, we'll be taking taking communion as it's the first Sunday of the month. Um, just so you know, you do not need to be a member here to take communion with us. The only thing we would ask is that you're a believer in Jesus Christ. And if that's the case, then we uh, invite you to join us this morning later in the service for communion. Those cups are also at the tables. In the bulletin, on the half sheet inside that insert, you'll see some things coming up um, in the next two weeks. I just want you to take note of these. We, we have a busy season coming up as we prepare for that 40 days of preparation, usually called Lent, which helps us prepare for Easter, especially uh, what we do during Lent is reflect on the suffering of Jesus. So that week, as we kick that off, we'll have a pancake supper on Tuesday, February February 13th, that'll be here at six o'clock. And then on February 14th, that's the official start of Lent. So we'll have a special prayer service. We'll begin in here, but we're actually gonna spend time all around the building that evening. Uh, so take note of those. Also note that the Bonhoeffer study continues this Wednesday night with chapter four. I think you're gonna really like chapter four in that book and I'm looking forward to you all having the opportunity to discuss that and think through it. And then lastly, if you have not let Pastor Nicole know about the uh, training or your intention to come to the training next Sunday, please see the note there and you can let her know this morning. With that said, will you stand with me as we approach the God who created all things for worship? We'll read responsively from Psalm 133. I'll read the light portion. Together we will respond with the bolded portion. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's head beard, that went down to the skirts of his garments, as the dew of Hermon and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. Let's pray together. Almighty and everlasting God, we come before you into your presence as your people, as your church. We do not claim our own merits or our own righteousness, but we claim that of Jesus Christ, who alone is the righteous one. Set our minds and hearts on you. Enable us to worship you in spirit and in truth and be glorified here in this room today. In Christ's name we pray, amen.
I read now from Romans chapter 12. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them, if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Let's pray together. Almighty and everlasting God, we thank you that by your merciful work accomplished in Christ Jesus, we who are sinners have become acceptable in your sight. We know we have nothing in ourselves with which to demand a seat at your table, but because we are in Christ Jesus, we approach you boldly. We therefore ask that you work in our lives to conform our thoughts and deeds to your will. Give us transformation and renewal so that we may walk in this world in a way that is worthy of our high calling. I thank you for the members of your church here at Monument Heights. You have uniquely gifted each of them for your service. Help us to come together as one body for the purpose of your kingdom work. Most of all, make us to love one another so that the world may know we are yours by that love. We pray for those members of our church and our extended family who stand in special need of your mercy and provision. We pray by name for Margaret Allen, for Agnes Arnold, for Linda Beasley, for Madeline Benton, for Don and Sylvia Carter, for Joan Davis, for Louise Dunbar, for Clint Hassel, for Renee Hawkins, for Hazel Hersman, for Pam Keeling, for Ken Nett, for Samuel Nuon, for Pat O'Brien, for Thomas and Shannon Pierce, for Barbara Pitts, for Lee Smith, for Suzanne Valls, for Frank Vaughn, and for Kay Williamson. Lord, you perfectly know their needs. I ask that you work in their lives in the way that is best for each one of them. I know that there are many others that I have not mentioned and more whose needs we do not know, but Lord, you know. Have mercy upon us and give us your healing, comfort, and peace. 
Most of all, hasten the day when there will be no more suffering, but we will dwell together in your presence forever. Until that day, hear us as we pray now with one voice in the way our Lord taught us when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I'll be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 13. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says, Jesus is accursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except in the Holy Spirit. Now there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit, who apportions to each one individually as he wills. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, 
so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we are, were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. Let's pray together. Almighty God, you have spoken to us in the words of Scripture. We pray that you would open our hearts to these words, that we would receive them, that you would make our minds attentive, but not just so that we would receive them intellectually, but that you would bury them deep into our hearts, deep into our affections. And Lord, what we pray for specifically this morning is that you would show us what it means to be your church as both individuals who are part of that church and as the collective group that is empowered by the same spirit. I pray that you would give us new insights that you would encourage us, and that you would lead us forward as a congregation. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Today we're taking a break from John, and the main reason for this break is to take some time to think about where we've been, especially last year, and where we're heading as we go forward. God, in his wisdom, continually equips the church And we see that in 1 Corinthians 12. So I hope that as we think together about 1 Corinthians 12, you will be able to see not just the church in Corinth, but you will be able to see Monument Heights as well. Again, God in his wisdom and faithfulness continually equips his church for service. And just as that was true in Corinth, it is true today for us. Now before we get to our text here in 1 Corinthians 12, there's some important background that we must understand to to understand the passage rightly. Paul writes this letter to the churches in a Greek city called Corinth. And Corinth was widely known in the ancient world for wild living. In fact, the word Corinth became a verb so that you could Corinthizo something, and it meant that you were engaging in sexual immorality. The church at Corinth appears to have let the culture affect them as well. They appear to be plagued by many of the same problems that you would expect in the city. And one problem that we see throughout this first letter to the Corinthians is divisions and disunity in the church. They don't seem to get along on anything. It's so bad that Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 11, the chapter before ours, that some are coming to the communion table and eating all the food before anyone else can even get there. There's this rampant, self-serving attitude throughout the church. And Paul addresses that problem of disunity in various ways throughout the letter. In our chapter, here in chapter 12, he does that by pointing out that the Spirit of God has individually equipped us for the good of the church. Put another way, what Paul is telling us here is our diversity, our differences, is a gift from God for the benefit of his people, what we call the church. The heart of this passage is basically this. Through the Spirit, God has called us into the church. And through the Spirit, God has empowered us in a variety of ways for the benefit of the church. I want to make three points from our text this morning. Number one, the Christian calling is an act of the Spirit. The Christian calling is an act of the Spirit. For years, I thought wrongly of the church. I viewed the church as something that was intended to meet my needs and satisfy me. 
I looked for churches with all the things that I liked. I needed the right music, I needed the right style, I needed the right people, I needed the right sort of preaching. And let me tell you, if you have any training in this stuff, it doesn't help make you a better church member, it probably makes you more critical of everybody else because you think you should be doing it. And so I got to a point where I thought I didn't really even need the church. And part of this is our culture. We're steeped in a culture of consumerism. Like we can go to the grocery store and buy 12 different brands of orange juice. We're we're not even stuck with the one brand. If we don't like it, we can pick from a dozen others. And sometimes it carries over into the church. We're not stuck with the church nearest our house. We're not stuck with the two or three churches close by. We have an endless variety of churches to choose from, especially in a city like Richmond. But then fast forward to COVID back in 2020, and in 2020, every church had an online option, and it got awfully comfortable to stay at home in pajamas. And so it gets even harder to commit to a church. And like consumers, if something doesn't satisfy us, we might complain We might write a nasty Google review, or we might just follow our society and take our business elsewhere. The Corinthians have some of these problems. The Corinthians, as we've pointed out, are self-interested. In fact, the heart, if I had to summarize in one sentence the message of Paul's letter to the, the church at Corinth here in 1 Corinthians, it would be that we are to do all things for the building up of the body of Christ. That is the church. That's Paul's basic message. Do all things for the building up of the body. In other words, it's not about me as an individual. It's about the collective body, what we call the congregation. It's about the church as a whole. Now, Paul responds to these problems in Corinth by pointing out that the church is a spirit-created community. So I said this, the Christian calling is created by the spirit. Look at verse 3 with me. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Now, First off, when he says they can't say these things, he doesn't mean the tongue's incapable of uttering the words with the syllable combination. What he's talking about is you can't speak these as truths from your heart unless the Spirit has enabled you to confess Jesus as Lord. So Paul responds by pointing out that the church isn't some sort of country club where we get around people who look like us. He says the church isn't a place for, uh, for just my people and my friends. He says the church is God's people who have been redeemed by the power of the Spirit. And as a result, God is extending His rule, His reign, His government, His kingdom and his presence through people like you and me. That's how it extends into this world. So look again at what Paul says at the end of verse 3. No one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. So nobody, according to Paul, can truly accept Jesus as their King, as their Lord, apart from the work of the Holy Spirit. And those who have accepted Jesus as their king do that through the work of the Holy Spirit. The Christian calling, the Christian life, is an act of the Holy Spirit. And it follows too then that if the individual calling is an act of the Spirit, then the church must be created by the Spirit. In other words... A church isn't created by some clever people or enterprising individuals that get together and say, you know what, it'd be a really good idea if we started a church. For it to be real and true, it must begin with an act of the Spirit that enables us to truly and sincerely and boldly proclaim that Jesus is our Lord and He's our King. The church is a spirit created community of people 
who give their allegiance to Jesus as their God and King. And so as I said, the church isn't a country club. It's not a place for my family and my friends and just my people. It's certainly not my church, as we sometimes say. It is God's church created through His Spirit. And the Spirit doesn't just initiate or actualize the church. The Spirit enables the church. So the, the, the initial calling is created by the Spirit. But then point number two for this morning, the Spirit's going to enable the church. Here's how I might put it. Point two. God gives each person an empowered gifting for service in the church. God gives each person an empowered gifting for service in the church. Look with me at verses 4 through 6. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in every one. And notice the the pattern here. Variety of gifts, same spirit. Variety of service, same Lord. Variety of activity, same God. And each of these things, whether we're talking about gifts or service or activity, are empowered by God. In God's wisdom, He gifts individuals with a diverse set of gifts for the good of the church. Look at verse 7 now. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Now that word manifestation just means a visible representation, something you can see. That is, the work of the Spirit is displayed through the use of gifts and service and activities. Let me put this another way. How do you see the work of God in our world? How do you see it? Well, you see it through people that are indwelt by the Spirit. When God's Spirit transforms a person, that is a manifestation of the Spirit. When someone forgives their enemy, that is the work of God. That is the work of the Spirit. When Mother Teresa moved to Calcutta to be in a leper community, we saw the work of God. And you can fill in the blanks here with endless examples of where we see this representation, this visible display that God is at work in this world. We see it in transformations all the time. People become radically different. They're empowered to do something that they could never do in their own strength. And don't miss the good news of this verse. God gives to each. Do you see that there? In verse 7, to each a manifestation of the Spirit. God doesn't leave individuals out. He gifts them differently. So He doesn't leave us out. He gifts us differently. Some will have gifts that are more public. Others will be more private. But make no mistake about it, God gifts His people through the Holy Spirit. Now, so much of the Christian life is about noticing. That is, paying attention to where God is at work already. And so it is in the church. Part of our job as members is to pay attention to where God is already at work in the people around us. I think I can illustrate this from ministry. There's this idea, maybe it's not as prevalent in Richmond, it's certainly prevalent in certain places in the U.S. There's this idea sometimes that pastors sort of bring the presence of God with them. So people will call you and say, you know, can you come? And we're happy to do that. But, but just so we're clear, uh, pastors don't actually bring the presence of God. I'll talk about that in a second. But, but we can begin to think this way as well. We can think it's, it's my job to bring something or to show something. And it can be, become this action that isn't spirit-empowered, but is actually self-empowered. Like sort of manufactured, right? Because we feel that pressure. Well, a few years ago, I got some advice from an older man that that helped me tremendously on this point. And and what he told me was I needed to make this subtle shift. My job isn't to bring the presence of God. My job is to notice and to point out the presence of God. There's a big difference in that. See, the presence of God is already there. God is already at work. And he's already at work quite apart from me. 
I didn't have anything to do with it. God is already up to that. He's working through the Spirit. He's, he's up to things. So I didn't create that reality. The, the Spirit creates that re- reality. So I say that because I think there's a danger when we talk about the Spirit enabling us. It's a danger for all Christians. When we talk about the Spirit enabling us, sometimes out of eagerness, we can try to manufacture a manifestation of the Spirit. We can so badly want to see God move that we can try to sort of create it. But this passage reminds us that nothing needs to be manufactured. The Spirit is given to each, and we didn't create that reality. This is a grace from God. Now, the opposite of noticing the work of God is illustrated in the New Testament Gospels by the Pharisees and religious leaders. When they see Jesus and the work that Jesus does, and we've seen this in John's Gospel already, they fail to recognize the clear and the powerful and the unmistakable work of God. In fact, in one interaction, they say, Jesus, you're casting out demons by the power of Satan. And you may recall what Jesus says there. He tells them they're blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Why does he say that? Because they're failing to recognize the very clear work of God, and they're taking it a step further. They're not just failing to recognize it. They're actually labeling it as something evil. There's a warning here for us, especially for us who live in such a cynical culture. If we aren't careful, we might label faithful work that is done in reliance upon the Spirit as human empowered. And that in itself is a type of blasphemy. If we fail to recognize where God is at work and we label it something other than the clear work of God. This is dangerous in churches. You know how cynicism sort of can grow and and we can start to sort of, the best way I can describe this is by using a chicken analogy. We can sort of peck at things. You know, if you have chickens and they get a weak spot, I learned this firsthand, they will literally peck each other clean. I had one get attacked by a possum one night and made the mistake of putting it back in the coop, and the next morning that poor chicken didn't look like a chicken any longer. The point is, we can do that in church. We can sort of peck each other to a point where we don't even recognize that God is actually at work. So why does God gift individuals? He doesn't do it for their own benefit. He doesn't do it so that we can make much of ourselves. He he doesn't gift someone like, like me, who's called to preach, he doesn't gift me for my own benefit. He gifts us for the benefit of the church. Again, look at the end of verse 7. He does this for the common good, that is, for the benefit of the church, the building up of the church. And he does this through a variety of gifts. We don't need to read all of these verses, but look at the examples given in verses 8 through 10. I'll just list the gifts. You have another set in our second reading from Romans 12. I'll just list them here though. Wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, miracles, prophecy, discernment, tongues, and interpretation. Now that's not a comprehensive list. The one in Romans 12 differs. You see other types of gifts in the New Testament. But this list gives us some examples of the variety of gifts God gives to his church. And again, These gifts are given to all of God's people, but not in the same way. In God's wisdom, a variety of gifts are distributed in different ways. Look at verse 11. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as He wills. So the gifts are not produced by humans... They are given by the Spirit. The same Spirit gives to each individually as He sees fit. Which leads me to my third point. The church is composed of a diverse people with various roles to play. The church is composed of diverse people with various roles to play. Let's look at verse 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body... So it is with Christ. 
Paul's going to draw an analogy from the human body. He says our human body has different parts. We have heads and eyes and ears and hands and feet and all sorts of other parts. And each of those parts has a different role to play. The ears can hear, but they can't taste. Each part has a function and a role. So it is in the church, the body of Christ. The Spirit enables for service, and that service is varied. Let me read a larger section here, starting in verse 14. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is... God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. Diversity, diversity of gifts, diversity of personalities, diversity of dispositions, all these things is a good thing. If the whole body were an eye, we couldn't hear. In the same way, diversity in the church is a good thing. If we all had the same gifts, we would be limited. In other words, there isn't some sort of Christian mold that we all need to fit into. Yes, we're all aspiring to be like Jesus, but that can take different shapes in our different lives. There isn't some sort of Christian mold that we all must conform to. Some Christians will be talkative, some will be quiet, some will be insightful, some will be caretakers, etc. The gifts are varied. One book about spiritual formation makes this point really well by highlighting the different personality types according to the Myers-Briggs test. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the Myers-Briggs test, but it's this old test that's been generally well received by psychological research, and it lists out 16 different personalities that have four letters with them. So you have like introverts and extroverts and, and, and uh, the different ways we perceive, and all of that's in there. This book does a really good job of pointing out that we're not all called to be the same, and it would be a failure on our part to recognize the wisdom of God and the role of the Spirit if we were to think that we all have the same giftings, dispositions, or personalities. The author writes, The problem for the Corinthians and for us is the tendency to view one's own pattern of preferences as the norm. In other words, the tendency is to think everyone should be like me. He goes on, he says, We expect others to conform to our norm to be like us, to approach life in our way. Or, there's actually an alternative approach. We may take this. We may assume we should be like somebody else. But all of that, whether we feel like we're being pressed into a mold and everybody else needs to be pressed into it, or, or that we feel like we need to be more like everyone else, all of that flies in contradiction to what Paul says here. In God's wisdom... He has made the church a group of diverse people with various roles to play. Don't quench the Spirit by making yourself fit a mold that God did not make you to fit. You see the issue with that. Look at verse 25. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And we should be thankful for the diversity in the body of Christ. I'm, I'm thankful for my head. It does a lot of things. But I don't ask it to hammer nails for me. I usually use my hand for that purpose. It's no problem that everyone isn't like me. Right? In the same way, that's no problem that my head can't hammer nails. In fact, if it were the case that we were all alike, we wouldn't be a functioning body. We'd be like an arm or a hand just sitting there. That means that God has not called the person sitting beside you, in front of you, behind you, to be you. God hasn't called you to be me. 
God hasn't called you to be any of our other staff members or anybody else in this church. God has called you to be you, and He has called you and them to be part of His church for the good of the church. The only way we can do that effectively is by being who God has, through His Holy Spirit, equipped us to be. The Spirit of God is at work in us. That's what this passage tells us. And that means on this Sunday, February 4th, 2024, the Spirit of God is active among us. And this is so important for us. And this is sort of the application I want to make for us this morning. It's so important because churches can have a tendency to look in the rearview mirror. Hopefully you know what I mean by that. But let me give you some examples. We've never done that before, right? looking backward. This is how we've always done it. Or, or I remember that time that was so great. And churches can make a mistake of looking back to a period of time and thinking it represents the golden years. I know we have that sort of in our history as a church. The 70s and 80s were booming here. And thank God for it. Because some of you are a result of that legacy. But the worst expression of this tendency to look backward is when churches do everything they can to preserve the supposed golden years of the past. A church living in the past becomes a museum, not a church on mission. It is impossible to move forward on mission if we're constantly looking backward. If we look backward, we make the Spirit stagnant because we are implying that the Spirit was only at work in the past and whatever new work of the Spirit with the new giftings and new combinations are interpreted as inferior or inadequate compared to the past. That is dangerous stuff. The Spirit is not stagnant, but active. And because the Spirit is active, that means God is at work in us now. And He does not want us to go to the past. He does not want us to constantly check the rearview mirror. He wants us to be sensitive to the Spirit. And He wants us to be aware of the gifts that He has given us here in 2024. And because the Spirit is active, we should notice... And we should celebrate where God is already at work. Let me just point out a few things to you. Uh, Start with the easy ones that are less barometers of success for us, but, but are still significant things to point out. Our attendance from 2022 to 2023 increased year over year Uh, by a significant portion. In fact, we hit a low point in 2022, the same uh, Sunday the next year, we were exactly double in attendance. Our finances from 2022 to 2023 increased by several percentage points, which churches that are struggling, not us, that's what I'm telling you, churches that are struggling don't make that turnaround. That what, what we've seen is, yeah, we, we've had a few years of finances heading downward, but over this last year, not only did they stop heading downward, they ticked up. Do you see that? That's something to celebrate about what God is doing here. We ended the year with, with a surplus, thanks to your generosity, your giving, your faithfulness in that way. So what I want to say to you is let's not negate the work of God by being downers. Let's not not wonder where God is. God is here at Monument Heights. Look what the Lord is doing. And more important than any of those numbers to me is the fact that God is transforming us here. This church has developed over the last few years a commitment to Scripture that I believe every church should learn from. It's in the air here. It's who we are. We are people of the book. We have multiple scripture readings every service. We have um, 20 people on Tuesday mornings who just want to study scripture. And again on Wednesday nights, people are hungry for God's word here. And that is a work of the Spirit. And now what we've done this year is we've 
we're praying together daily every morning at 9 o'clock. You can join us in person. You can jump online for the 15-minute prayer, or you can call in on your phone. And it's been an incredible experience. When we began this, our pastors talked about what we felt was the inevitable reality that we would be praying alone with each other at 9 o'clock on most of those days. And yet, we've only had that experience one time where we've been alone in the building, but we've never had the experience where we've been the only ones praying. Every single day in our third month of daily prayer now, we have between 10 and 20 people gathering either online or in person to pray as a community of spirit-empowered believers. This is a different church than it was a few years ago. And that's not a bad thing. It is something to celebrate because the Spirit of God is at work among us. And that doesn't say anything negative about the past. God was at work then too. He was at work in 1950 when He empowered the original members to plant this church on the frontier of Richmond as a church for missions. And He's been at work through all of the pastors who've preceded me and through the church members who have faithfully used their gifts. But my point is that God in His wisdom and faithfulness continually equips the church. And He is doing that today at Monument Heights. One practical thing I've been talking about and want us to give some attention to this year is using your gifts for the common good. In other words, I want to embrace the spirit-empowered diversity in this room. A few years ago when we talked about our formation plan, we used this language, every member a minister. Every member a minister. Because that's the New Testament calling. We're not all called to have the same gifts, but the goal is for every individual to be equipped for service in the kingdom of God. And that necessarily means accounting for our differences. Everyone does not need to preach, but every one of us is called to some form of ministry, to some form of service. And what we want to do this year is help you to identify the different gifts that God has empowered you with We want to identify the different gifts in our church, in this room, and we want to give you opportunities to use those gifts and see what God will do through you for the good of His church. For now, as I close, our task is to pay attention to where God is at work among us and to celebrate it. Our task is to recognize the divine diverse combination of people in our congregation. I, and I mean here the gifts. We've talked about our, our diversity. We have people from four, four different continents here. We have multiple languages. You'll, you'll see that in uh, Pentecost when we, when we pray the Lord's Prayer like we did last year in multiple languages. God has brought people together that by all earthly rights have no business being together, but that is the church. Here there is no slave, nor free, Greek, nor Jew. We are one in the body of Christ. So our task is to recognize that diverse combination of people in our congregation and then faithfully work together for the glory of God and for the good of one another. Let me pray for us. Lord, we bless your name for your faithfulness. You have been faithful to this church who has gathered here on the corner of Monument and Libby for the last 74 years. People have come and gone, and yet your spirit has been at work from the beginning. We thank you for our past. We thank you for the legacy and the history here. But Lord, help us not to be stuck there. Help us to move forward with the full and confident assurance that you go before us and you equip us for service today and you have brought a different set of people together as a congregation for today. Lord, help us to embrace our gifts. Give us the endurance and grace to be faithful in the use of those gifts and help us, Lord, to serve this body of believers. May what we say and do and think serve to build up your church here in Richmond. 
Christ. We also pray now for the other churches, our sister churches, all around this city, all around this nation, and all around this world. We pray that you would, through the same Spirit, empower our brothers and sisters around the world for the work of ministry, for your glory, and for the good of your church. Lord, we pray that if there's any here who has not embraced Jesus, that you, through your Spirit, would open the eyes of their heart to embrace him. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. We want to give you an opportunity to respond today. The way we do that is by coming to the table. I've already said you do not need to be a member here at the church to come to the table. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, Christ has won that right for you. You are welcome to the table and there's not a person here who can stop you. So if you would join us in communion, that's wonderful. If you're not a believer, then let this table be a witness to you. God invites you through Christ to sit at a table at peace with the God who created you. That is the work of Christ. And by turning to him, you have every right to sit at the table. If you're interested in church membership here at Monument Heights, if you're excited about what God is doing, we'd love to have that conversation. We are having lunch today. We're having some conversation about new membership with some others in this room. If you'd like to just sort of join us to begin with, uh, we can do that. So you're all invited to our first Sunday lunch. It's free. Uh, it's all donation-based. So if you want to give, that's fine. But don't let that be a barrier to joining us today. Our choir is going to help us prepare our hearts for communion. While they do, one of our ushers is in the back. If you want to take communion and fail to get a cup, if you just lift your hand during this song, they'll make sure to bring you a cup. Use this time to reflect and prepare your heart for the table.
Will you join me in confessing our shared faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to the place of the dead. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence He shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Notice what is happening as we come to the table. It seems ordinary. It's bread and it's a cup. But yet, in this central ordinance of the Christian life given to us, we are reminded of the grace that is in our Lord Jesus Christ. There is nothing ordinary about what we're about to do. In 1 Corinthians 11, the Apostle Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray for our meal together and receive our benediction. Almighty God, we thank you for your very many blessings. Chief among them is the ability to come before you in worship. Be with us now as we go forth from this place. Bless our time of fellowship and the food to the nourishment of our bodies. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with us all, now and unto the ages of ages. Amen.